And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a few newcomers here in the temple. Come, the three, the multi-headed monster that I, that is Team Rex Games, consisting of er, consisting of Eric, Richard, and Shoshana. <laughs> try saying try saying her name three times fast. <laughs> and and creators of the upcom creators of the upcoming RPG, The Vault. How you how how are you three doing today? Or tonight. A little cold, but excellent. Little cold. Yeah. How cold Doing great. Little... Ready to talk about it. Yep. Thanks for inviting us to the temple. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming on. Um, just getting this out of my system. How cold is it over there? I think we're at four degrees tonight. I actually think overnight it's going to be negative eight. It's pretty cold. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I got your beat. It's negative 11 over here. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, the saying that I have about the weather, if you don't like it, wait 10 minutes. Exactly, exactly. From our frozen hellscape to yours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not a frozen hellscape, it's just Fimble Winter. <laughs> and if you get that reference, you get a cookie. So, I'd like to start I don't with... think Shoshana gets a cookie. <laughs> Well, um, the library's that way. Well, I, use, I like to start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Uh, I guess I'll go first. Uh, the beginning of role-playing games for me was somewhere between 2nd Edition D&D &D and GURPS. And uh, we were in high school, and the the just the group of us ended up really kind of getting into everything that was going on at the time, and it worked out really well for us. I'm not I'm not sure which thing it was about my first character that I liked the most, but I definitely started off as a min maxer, so I had a GURPS ogre with an intelligence of a goat, and uh, you know I could crush walls and stuff. That was cool. Uh, and then D and D brought brought balance into my life, I think. All right. And what what about the rest of you? Yeah, um, I had always been super interested in all the fantasy, Lord of the Rings, Star Warsy stuff, mm -hmm. all that good nerd things. Um, and finally, in high school, someone was like, "Hey, do you want to join the little D and D group I'm putting together?" And so, you know, every day after school for a couple hours, we'd move our adventure down the road a little bit. Um, if it's all dating Richard, I was in high school for fourth edition D and D, um, and that crazy uh, MMORPG version of a role playing game. And then I've also been involved in a lot of the. Um, Warhammer RPGs and a couple other systems and testing those out. Mm -hmm. And Shoshana, what about you? I've always been a, a fan of sort of complicated board games, but didn't get into role-playing games until about three years ago after I met Richard. Um, so Vault is actually my conception of what a role-playing game is and everyone should play it um but we've also done a few uh D, D 5e campaigns as well um they're a lot of fun mm -hmm. uh, since you mentioned complicated board games how complicated were we talking like twilight imperium played twilight imperium we've played a lot of gloomhaven we don't actually own twilight imperium um i like puerto rico except that its theme makes me deeply uncomfortable uh, uh yeah. What about um, Catan? Yeah, I mean, that's what I started with way back in, I don't know, college maybe? Um, that's my, my gateway to the joy that is complicated board games. Mm -hmm. um, well, for a, it, the funny thing is a lot of people's introduction to more complicated takes with board games is the death march that is Monopoly. 
<laughs> Probably just just a bad time. I think my my example of what makes board games bad is Risk, though, where it's like the game ended four hours ago, but we're still playing for some reason. Um, <laughs> I I would be shocked shocked if you had if you had played a single round of the campaign for North Africa. I've heard of that one. You, it is particularly infamous for how complicated it could get. Um. I've only played one, I've only played one round of it, but the but the map for the map for the game itself is massive. I'm gonna go check that one out. Um, well, you're you're gonna have a hard time finding the thing. It's been out of print for the longest time. It was, it was one of those it was one of those games that was made, that was made right that was in that fixation with um with simulate with simulating. With um sim simulating war simulating um certain ba certain battles, that ca that um that particular trend in the seventies, and just to give a bit of perspective, I'm going to show you guys an image of what the map looks like. The child in the image is just is just for comparison. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> that's that's got Gloomhaven beat. <laughs> See, this is the reason why whenever someone says that a certain that certain games are too complicated, I laugh because they have no idea how deep the rabbit hole goes or how good they really have it. Yeah, years of years of us actually dialing in game mechanics so they're actually playable is pretty great. Mm -hmm. Um Apparently, apparently, there are a few people I know who played who played um, CNA, as it's called, uh, when they were in the military, and that was and arguments about that about whose turn it was in that game could turn into fights. <laughs> it's it wasn't I wasn't surprised at all when I found that it was one of the er it was one of the earliest takes of attempt of a, or one of the earlier takes of attempting to convert a board game into a, a computer game. Mm -hmm. So that a lot of the stuff runs in the background. That'd be pretty. That that makes a lot of things easier. Yeah. But were you guys mostly mostly one system lifers, or did you actually? I was gonna say the one system lifer question, but it's kind of already answered with the amount with the fact that some of you had mentioned multiple systems. I mean, I think I was definitely in the 3.5 Pathfinder camp for about as long as you could possibly be there. Uh, Don't forget, you're here forever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's harder to stay in a game when it's not actually getting new stuff. Mm -hmm. But within, within that, that brings me to... Um, to the vault, to the vault, and how did this i how did this idea come about? Was it just a case of wanting to throw together a bunch of things that you guys were already interested in? Yeah, it's Richard's uh, brainchild. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the games that I didn't mention that I really really loved for pretty much the entire time I've been playing games was Shadowrun. Um. And the only problem with loving Shadowrun is trying to use its rules. Um, How many pounds of dice? <laughs> we we have a dice collection here. Um, some cups. <laughs> uh, I didn't say cups. So, I said pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know, you need the cups to roll the pounds of dice. So there's that. Um, and there's been just like a lot of really cool cyberpunk stuff that's come out lately and a lot of good fantasy stuff that's come out and we thought we'd take our own crack at trying to do a spin on it and really kind of play with the concept of alternate histories and fey mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's kind of where it came from um systemically we all really love war games so a lot of the the things that are kind of the bones of how the game kind of started its its maths was uh, a lot 
lot of Iron Kingdoms, a lot of Hordes and War Machine. Uh, Warhammer has had some pretty good influences on some different things. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're a solidly D6-based game, so even like real old-school Star Wars uh, creeps its way into a lot of the way we did some of our math to kind of make things uh, feel exciting and still have some sense of balance to them. Yeah. Now... With with that in with that in mind, I did I certainly did see that D, that DNA in that DNA in there, mm-hmm. and so, given that given that, I'd like to u- I'd like to use that to kind to kind of to kind of segue into some of some of the infamous critiques with Shadowrun that I've that I've brought up in previous interviews and how you guys are planning to tackle them. Awesome. And the first one of those is in regard to the sk- in regard to the skill bloat, and I I know some people will defend it, but th- but don't li- but we can't lie to ourselves. Shadowrun has skill bloat, a lot of it, and because of that, you end up with the issue of analysis paralysis, because you- because you have to figure out where you're going to be putting those skill points in and. Granted, um, Shadowrun Fifth Edition did try and mitigate the issue with the priority system, but it's a still a cold comfort as you advance. Yeah. Uh, so you start off the game with a lot of skill points. Like where you're you're picking two classes, and each one of them will come with a pretty good set of uh, skills that kind of help form you in whatever direction it was that you were going to be going in anyways. Um, And then mostly what you're picking is a couple of points here and there as you're playing the game that you're adding to those skills that you've kind of already set up for yourself. Uh, You can go in crazy directions and really invest more in those skills. And often when you're taking skill points, you're choosing, did I want more hit points or did I want more skill points at this particular little XP bump? So... There's a little bit of extra decision making when it comes to skills, but also you kind of know what you wanted to be good at. Mm-hmm. We also have a cap at a certain value depending on your XP le- level, and um, there's only seventeen like skills in our in our game that span the ranks of like running and climbing to hacking terminals or deceiving people or uh, repairing your car, whatever it could be. Yeah. Uh, what I did notice is that you have you have skill points and then you have weapon ranks separate. Is it a case where the skill point where um both of, where those things even though you're even though you're um, improving them, they're not drawn from the same pool? That is correct. Uh, the weapon ranks are few and far between rare and hyper valuable because mm-hmm. they'll height they'll influence your accuracy of whatever weapon group you're trying to use whether that be the pistols or the machine guns or um even throwing a grenade or something mm-hmm. sometimes they even influence your damage like in our unarmed we did that if folks were real good at punching they boy they should be really really good at punching things I really like about our system is that there's there's sort of constant little leveling so the, there are abilities which are sort of like feats in D&D that you only get occasionally but after just about every mission or a couple of missions you can expect to get a couple of hit points or a couple of skill points or a new ability to choose um, so, so it's sort of continuous growth for your character which is a lot of fun Now, with that in, with that in mind, obviously, when you're dealing when you're dealing with um, modern or even or even future tech setups, it's very it can be a very easy trap to fall into to have me, to have um, melee weapons get outclassed by firearms. How do you make sure to how do you make sure that kind of thing doesn't happen, or th- or that w- or that one doesn't out useful the other? Shall I say? Uh, 
in a lot of cases, it's really good to be good at both. A lot of times you kind of want them for different things. Um, we, If you want a magic weapon, it's going to be a melee weapon. And we have like a whole system around they'll be dedicated to a particular purpose. And as you fulfill that purpose, it grows in power. And you'll kind of pick out based on that purpose, like a chain of things that that sword will actually gain from doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then... In the ranged system, we have just a ton of different ammunitions that can just let you fix all sorts of different problems that you might be dealing with. Um, And they're things that you just buy for that weapon, and you have them. You're not rebuying ammunition to make sure that just once you've gone into the downtime, you fill back up your ammunition because you're a a reasonable character. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's just a lot of different avenues to go in each one and if you want to be really well-rounded you're probably going to be pretty good at both yeah one of the other things is uh like shooting weapons into combats can prove to be hard when you're shooting around your allies and stuff trying to avoid you know hitting them with the blast template or such um but um the melee weapons of course don't have that problem and there's a lot of tailored abilities to the melee group that give you very fun and interesting bonuses to hitting harder, to cleaving through a whole bunch of foes, or even actually being able to kind of dance around through combat and not worry about opportunity attacks and things like that. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously one, th- one thing that I think is going to stick out to me is somebody who's endured Shadowrun in one form or another over the years is the fact that not only do you guys have a class system, but you have a two-class system. And I'm curious how you guys have that work and what a class actually br- actually brings into the table. Uh, yeah, so you'll, you'll pick your two classes, and they'll range from things like Assassin to Bodyguard to Witch Hunter. Uh, then on like the more magic side, we have a Shaman and a Mage. Um, Adept... Uh, so you can, you can be your, your magic, uh, punchy monk, um, or you can just be really outstandingly good with a sword. Both, both routes of that through both magic and through technology are available. Uh, and then the types of things that you're getting, a lot of those classes will set like a, like a primary kind of ability that you're going to kind of set the rest of your build around. Mm-hmm. So like with the bodyguard, it is literally getting getting in front of your friends before they get hurt. Um, and then you, you may decide that that one ability is going to kind of determine the rest of the build for your character. Um, obviously with mage, it's going to be spellcasting. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the other things that come with it are a set of contacts. We've, put a lot of effort into our contact system and making sure that like when you're a mage if you're learning new spells it's because you have a arc mage friend who you're developing a relationship with and as you develop that relationship they're willing to teach you more and more powerful spells Mm -hmm. uh and that costs money uh so the 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 classes will definitely set those kind of core line abilities and then you'll kind of decide which direction you want to take it based on the other core line ability that you kind of picked. It also sets all your base equipment and a bunch of uh, those, that massive amount of kind of early skill points that kind of decide what your character is going to know the most about. Mm -hmm. Um, Did I miss anything, Eric? Uh, No, not particularly. Um, It also sets your ability groups. So we have a handful of groups from which you can actually pull our abilities from, and those are determined by which classes you've picked up. So you can get a maximum of four or a minimum of two of these ability groups, and uh, you'll be kind of locked in there so that the random techno samurai doesn't have magic powers or the um, the <laughs> the debonair suit-wearing face character uh doesn't have access to the um the sniper rifle tr- tree of abilities or things like that um unless they chose other things for their backup class components um and yeah those initial class abilities are pretty much are the very much the strongest thing that you get starting off 
and they they kind of build up as you learn your character so that you're not starting off with a thousand things to know right off the bat. We kind of drip feed you your your stuff, but faster than your typical D and D lets you like level up or change gear or whatever. Mm-hmm. And speaking of speaking of that, since Shadowrun had something like Shadowrun and and similar ones had a XP as currency approach. I know that they called it karma, but I'm calling a spade a spade. Mm-hmm. Where in where um you ba- you basically gathered it and then you spent it on whatever you felt like spending it on. Um, are you guys t- are you guys taking a similar approach, or are you guys taking a different approach with how XP is going to be utilized? Super different. Uh, your XP chart will say at 2 XP, you're going to pick either uh, another 2 skill points or a hit point. Mm -hmm. And then at 4 XP, you're going to pick out either an ability or a weapon rank. Mm -hmm. And so you're you're getting kind of some A, B choices that can also kind of branch off into like other serious decisions that you may want to make with where those things are actually going to go but we're kind of doing a slightly more guided thing so that you don't end up with the sniper who has to pick up a bucket of dice before they can actually take their shot yeah Um. the other part of our um xp system yeah and and as you're asking xp is purely xp in our game it's it there's no using it for other things or taking a weird addiction or something to get more of the XP units to improve your character. No Just that kind matching. of... No, not quite level that, that far level of it. Um, and we also have uh, three tiers of experience that we consider the like proper ones. Um, absolutely, in our first book, we'll have the first tier, which is Mercenary. You're just a merc learning the ropes and and maybe you've got some skills and knowledge from your your background but you're uh building up a bunch of stuff and then in our second tier um will be exemplar which has a lot of uh really unique abilities built into it that you can kind of that you'll be able to pick one of it'll really add some spice and some interest and change up how your character might work or your your drone rigging or your ability to um, use and spend our fate mechanic things like that uh, and then the third tier will be world shaper where we really blow the heck off of everything and you're fighting the the super evil demon monsters and we're not gonna include that in our first set we're pretty sure it's uh, we've got a lot of development to do to get that one right because it's that late game play and most RPGs is hard to do, let alone kind of building one up from scratch. Yeah, I can get, I can certainly get that. Now, since you since you brought it up, I do want to ask about the the fate system that you have and how that works, because a lot of games will have their what I call their extra effort system. Obviously, in Shadowrun, that was Edge. In World of Darkness, it's willpower. In D and D four E, there were action points. Um, 5e it's supposed to be inspiration but jury's really out on that um is fate your equivalent of that and how and how is it really gonna how's it going to work Richard, do you want to take this one uh i think shoshana's got this one yeah um so i i I would say that it is similar to what you're describing it's the extra effort um in general you start off a mission with with three fate points um and they're a little bit precious in that there's a lot of things you can do with them. Um, the The most obvious thing that I feel like fate is used for is when you are damaged, you can mitigate some of the damage that you end up taking uh, by spending fate for that. But you can also spend fate on various actions. So you can spend fate to grapple someone um, or you've got different abilities that use fate to do some sort of other special activity. Uh, and then as far as how pressured it is, we um, we give the players quite a bit of control as to how they, they regain it. So our critical system is your two highest dice when you're rolling two dice. Maybe you get a third dice. Uh, if those are the same number and it succeeds, it's a critical success. And if those two lowest dice uh, uh, 
happen on a failure, then that's a critical failure. Um, the critical failures don't come up nearly as often. It's really only if you're like using like a looted weapon that they're somewhat likely to explode. Um, but uh, most of the time, those criticals are what are determining whether or not you're regaining fate. Um, so you don't really know how much of it you're going to have to work with, and it doesn't go above your max of three. So sometimes you're like, well, I should just start spending it because I keep rolling all these criticals. And then it just kind of dries up on you and you really have to start really making hard decisions as to how you're going to spend it. Mm -hmm. no. When the other way to gain fate is defeating foes. Mm -hmm. um, so every time you take down an enemy, you'll gain a fate back as well um, if they're a high enough caliber enemy. And that helps you replenish the supply as well. And there's fun mechanics built into some of the abilities that, that touch on when you're taking somebody out or they're getting a critical or taking you out and gaining fate from those things. Mm -hmm. Now, one, one other factor that I saw with, with, with um, the character building blocks is style and, of course, species. Um, so what, what I'm curious with that is, is first off, what, st what style is and what it brings to the table, and second, how much of a factor... Or rather, what or rather, what changes based on your chain based on your choice of species? Does it change maximums, minimums? What? How is it going to work? Uh, yeah. So, when you pick your species, that will set your kind of baseline stats, mm -hmm. and then you'll get more points at character creation that have limits based on that species to decide where you want to put them into. So, if you're a Feyborn, you really have a hard time getting your strength anywhere near as strong as our Eos, which are our big strong guys. It's it's pretty much impossible. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of how we were able to kind of diffuse some of that, like, well, my friend rolled much better stats than me, so they're going to end up having main character syndrome, and I'm just going to kind of make sure everyone everyone's buffed up as well as I can, because I rolled a bunch of 10s. Um, so we kind of wanted to give everyone an even playing field from that perspective, and those points can that you're spending at character creation to decide where you're, where you're putting things, they uh, they have some pretty good downflow effects. Um, while we're on the topic of stats, uh, one of my big rules in game design that I'm I'm being real strict with in this system is our core stats aren't affected in gameplay. So you don't have to worry about taking con damage and then not being able to remember whether or not you just died because it also affected your hit points. If something mm -hmm. is going to do uh, a, a debuff to something, it's going to actually be those composite stat debuffs that are going to affect those things and those are going to be the things that get mentioned mm -hmm. so that you don't have to run around on your character sheet figuring out what just happened to you. All right. Um, and then um, species. So there's Feyborn, which are your very kind of classic uh, Fey creature. They have wings. They can fly. They're pretty cool. They can do a little bit of magic all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have Changelings, who are uh, Fey who did not leave when the Iron Age happened. So they've been kind of poisoned by Fey by uh, Irons. Uh, presence in the world this entire time that they've just been here and didn't actually bug out with the rest of the Fae. Uh, so they're really bad at magic, uh, but they have just some like innate cool abilities like being able to change what they look like. Uh, but they've been here the whole time. Uh, Eos are our genetically designed super soldier. They're a little bit clumsy, but other than that, they're pretty much good at, at doing all the things when it comes to warfare. Uh, and they're they're big, which is a real... Uh, useful bonus to have in our game. Uh, humans are the the baseline thing. We made them super versatile. You can you can pretty much do anything well as a human. Uh, mm -hmm. Dwarves also came in through our portals, so they're the ones that brought a lot of the more advanced technology. They're really good at doing the technology stuff, and they're, as one might expect, super tough. And elves, elves are our children of mages, uh, so they. They have a lot of extra bonuses when it comes to doing magic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's pretty much the breakdown there. Yeah. Now, with, that covers species, but I don't I don't think we went too in-depth when it comes to styles. Ah. Uh, you want to yeah. do styles, Eric? Sure. Uh, so we have four main styles in our game. Mystic, which is your magic users. The required to take the mystic group. Um... 
there is uh, the um, a Titan uh, one, which is for your big, beefy berserkers. They earn rage points and get fun uses to spend them on, so they have their own kind of system and economy for it. We have Slayer, which are your really nimble attackers who are going to get a lot of extra uh, stabs or shots in in a turn. They're going to be your... Um, uh, who's the lady from Underworld, you know, dual-wielding pistols, shooting a Celine. whole bunch, being... Celine, yes, doing all that fun stuff. Um, and then our fourth group is Strategist. Mm -hmm. um, they're the folks that are going to buff everybody. They're going to make sure that uh, people and the drones all communicate and work together, that people aren't blocking other people's line of sights. They are the big helper of the group. Uh, they're my favorite uh, of the style bonuses. Because they're always very, uh, they're they're they often take the role of kind of like the bard of the group and support everyone else, but they're very fun, um, and have their own special little tree of of things they can pull off. Um, but each of them within their group, that style, they get a, a single ability, whether that be having rage points as a titan to shrug off um, the the more d disastrous injury effects or um, the ability to cast and uh, use spells and learn them, mm. or even uh, on the uh, Slayer one is purely an extra attack. Just that's what you get. That's flat bonus. Mm. Um, you're going to hit people more often. Um, and as the game goes on, you get more of uh, the additional style bonuses, is what we like to call them. And they're like a separate group of abilities that are usually pretty short and succinct, but have a really dynamic effect on stuff like, oh, you don't have to charge in a straight line now. Or, um, hey, everyone around you gets plus one to hit because you're, so, cause you're telling them where to hit the, the enemy targets. Or um, my wizard has spent a lot of time in his, in his studies, so now he can learn more spells, and he has uh, developed his ability to... Um, uh, deflect damage uh, from himself, and and so there's there's some of those in there. Just kind of a, more abilities give you more flavor to work with. Mm -hmm. So taking taking that into account, I'd like to I'd like to put the um class and st class and style system to the test, and I'm gonna give you the the uh, base, some of the base archetypes from Shadowrun, and how you might integrate them into this system. Sweet. All right. Let's yeah. Start, let's, let's do it. Let's start. <laughs> let's start with. Let's start with. Let's start with what everybody. What everybody plays when they need all. When they need all the weapons. Street Sam. Yeah. Uh, let's see if I were to want to emulate a street Sorry? Sam. In the street Sam. You you would like us to emulate that in our system? Is yes. that is that correct? Yeah. So Pit Fighter is the person who specializes in our cybernetic system. They get a ton of bonuses. The more cyberware they've got, the the tougher they are. The less likely they're going to get affected by mind affecting stuff. And I'd probably, if you're really trying to do as broad of a thing as possible, make them a Titan. Uh, I'd probably give them the monstrous leap uh, Titan ability, where you can you can jump around and reposition yourself very efficiently. Mm -hmm. And I'd probably mix it with weapon specialist, which is uh, you get to start off the game with a extra super cool, um, highly expensive, highly customized weapon of your choice, and you're fantastic at it. Um, and it's just like a whole boatload of money you get to kind of start off the game digging through the equipment section figuring out how, how you want to make your awesome weapon mm -hmm. so with then with that in mind um next of course would be would be mages and for the sake of it i'll go for the sake of it i'm going to split this into the combat mage and the shaman mage Combat mage doesn't really narrow it down enough. <laughs> I feel like um, the combat I... mage. The combat mage is all is all is I think self-explanatory. They like to use their spells to blow shit up. Yeah. So we we have um, five schools of magic for mages that are that are sort of element focused. We've got 
earth, frost, fire. Uh, what am I missing? Storm. Storm, and then mana, mana, uh, which is sort of generic magic y willpower type things. Um, so for for the classic uh, elementalist who wants to blow shit up with magic, um, the fire and storm schools are really good at, I am going to throw lightning at you. It will kill you. Um, but we also have a lot of abilities that are more based on, I'm going to hit you with a stick really good um, using my magic spells. So um, I'm actually, we're doing a side campaign now where I'm playing a, a mana mage uh, who's a also a melee focused character so i have a staff and if i hit you with my stick real good then i can also um auto damage you with my magic abilities uh so i feel like there's there's a couple different ways to do magic whether you want to be more uh, melee character or more throwing elements at people um and then i really like mixing a more combat focused class with a more skills and abilities type class so so mage mixes well in my experience with like a face who can do negotiations really well um they get some extra cool business suits when they start out the game which is nice both for the negotiations and also with like pretty good armor um so that's that's probably the combat mage combo i like best is storm mage uh face mm-hmm. and then what was the second one shaman yeah shaman um so we have three shaman totems uh one is totem of the hunt which comes with generally a wolf though there's a few different options there um which is based on dealing damage with your companion having your wolf go rip people's throats out whatnot um one is totem of endurance which is more about taking damage well uh so they generally start off with a bear so they also have upgrade options to make their companion bigger and tougher um actually the upgrade for the bear is a big turtle which i love um so you can hide behind it um it bites people really hard but the main thing that the the bear and the totem of nerds can do is they they can take hits really well Mm -hmm. um and then there's totem of the sky where you generally start off with an eagle um, and they're really, they pair really well with a sniper type character where you can, um, they, they help you make your ranged attacks go well. And they can do some tricksy things like pick up your enemy and turn them around backwards so you can shoot them in the back. Um, so again, a few different ways to build them once you're going shaman. Yeah. And throughout all of them, there, all of them, there's... M- a lot more of our buffing spells end up in our shaman uh, groups, and a lot more of our damagey stuff ends up in our mage group, but they're by no means exclusive, and you can definitely find both in there, and you can even mix and match and meld them together, so you could have a really magic-dependent character who can blast people and have a bear run up and, and eat their face off, or, or heal them if needed. And with so the next one that I have on the list is the face man. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of different routes to go with that. Um, probably our info ripper, which is the one who does our our hacking system the best. Mm-hmm. And a face would be the 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 big combo there. And our face is like as as much as it, you know totally loads up on all your skill points and tries to get you as good at doing all of those uh tricksier things it also it's its main line abilities are also very important on that that trickster front you get to start off the game being able to redirect people's attacks into other people and then mm-hmm. convincing them that they shot their friend instead of trying to shoot each other and trying to mm-hmm. turn that crossfire thing on its head in, in just the right way okay. um so and then you know it depends on what kind of what kind of talking talking skill monkey you want to be cuz it's it's just as good to combine that with the bodyguard so you can be redirecting stuff and absorbing stuff and uh, having having a good old time manipulating the battlefield mm-hmm. one of my favorite abilities we've added in the game is um innocent looking so that if your character is kind of that face guy and they don't have any weapons uh most enemies won't target them 
they won't go after them if you're not looking like you're harming people or carrying around the bomb or, or a gun or something. They'll kind of pass you over, so there's a lot of opportunity to use that in fun ways. Yeah. Now, the next one on my list is the Adept. Mm -hmm. You know, basically, the, basically those who use magic, but they use magic to improve their to improve their body instead of using it externally. Yeah, we pretty much used that concept. We we just that is one of our classes. It's just fun. There we could have tried to dress it up and make it make it be something else, and you know, call it like a spirit warrior or something. And it just didn't seem worth it. People know what an adept is if they've played any of these types of games before. And like, if you want to be a Jedi, you can do it. Uh, and you still get to mix it with something else, so you still get to really put your own spin on it, which is why we really loved the two class system as we started digging into what we could do with it. Mm -hmm. um, they... And then, yeah, they'd probably be a mystic. They have a you know the the typical barrier to help absorb damage coming at them. They can improve those melee attacks they're taking. Um, someone good to go in with them might even be our assassin uh, class, who gets extra bonuses for hitting people in the back um, and can sneak around and hide really well. Or perhaps even our um, you know bodyguard class, who's big and heavy and in the way, or our runner class who lets you take all kinds of extra attacks for and has lots of mobility options for running around the battlefield and imposing penalties and helping your allies and all kinds of things like that. Mm -hmm. Now, the next one, the, the next one that I technically have on my list is Mystic Adept, but that's basically just kit bashing. Um, adept and mage, so that's one's kind of self-explanatory. So I'm skipping that. Sure. Um, the next one, and I'm, this one might be a bit trickier, but the rigor. No, we did that too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we we call them drone operators. We have a whole drone combat system. The only real caveat or slash warning I'll give people when it comes to that one is there are is usually within a game group one or two people who really want that kind of micromanagement experience where if they're willing to like sit there and do the math during everyone else's turn they can like explode on their next turn and kind of just do something really kind of intensely awesome mm -hmm. and that's where we did a lot of like you use your actions to convert into network points and then you use those network points to convert back into actions on your drones and you kind of work your network of drones to make them do the things all the ways you need them to do. Uh, one of the cooler things that uh, we've we've put in is once you've positioned all your drones in the right way, you can overload them all and have them kind of arc electrical power between them to do damage to the different things uh, that they've managed to position themselves around. Mm -hmm. um, so that's there and you still get to mix it with something else it tends to pair really well with uh hack the not hacker uh info ripper where you're both really good at stealing people's uh drones and using your own and protecting yours from getting stolen mm -hmm. and one of the most fun combos we've actually found with the drone operator because they uh get so many more attacks in a turn is they generate fate really well which is something our witch hunter class really likes we have a whole other class for dealing with magic users. They, of course, cannot be a magic user themselves, but they're really good in, in melee and tussling with those uh, spell-slinging folks. And them having a robot dog or a bunch of tick drones to help them take stuff down is pretty wild combo that gets things going during a game. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe the... The next one that I have on next one that I have is the Decker, which is basically the hacker, and you you kind of already hinted at that one. Yeah, uh, it's a little bit slightly off topic, uh, but the coolest thing I have to say about this one it has more to do with the hacking system than it does mm -hmm. about that particular uh, class. Well, let, well, let's get into that because hacking is one of those things that science fiction and and cyberpunk games have a tenuous relationship with because when in some in the worst case scenario you have the hacker doing his thing while everybody else is just sitting there with their thumb up their ass. Yeah, we didn't like that. 
Um, so what we <laughs> join the club. <laughs> so our our plan for fixing this particular problem is a deck of cards that is going to have all the different systems that you're going to try to be hacking. So your game master is going to say, like, I didn't prepare a hack for that door that you wanted to hack. I have these cards, and I think this this door is going to be roughly this hard, and that's going to come with these two other systems on it. One of them is a firewall that has to be defeated before you can actually get it through the door, and the other one is a, an ice-style thing that's going to do damage to you. And they just lay the cards out in front of the person, and the person just makes a few skill rolls against the effects that are the cards in front of them. And then they've beaten the hack or they haven't. Mm -hmm. It has a limited number of attempts that you can attempt. And then we have a whole system of um, software upgrades that you can do to like reset the hack or nuke something from orbit and be like that one system over there. That's just a pain in my ass. It's gone. Yeah. Um, and the idea is to really try to both offload the stress of the game master to try to prepare every single toaster that the the hacker might try to hack mm -hmm. and to make it always less than five minutes and mm -hmm. often happening during combat and it's just a combat action that's happening during combat they decide whether they're doing that with their combat action or something else mm -hmm. and there might even be an ability or two to shift what kind of an action it is so that they can be a bit more efficient so that they can be shooting stuff while typing away at the computer or brain hacking as it it might be mm -hmm. yeah you can't be a man in the van in in our game you have to be kind of up mixing it up with uh the things as i think hacking actually says proximity is the best thing for hacking mm -hmm. so we uh, really played that up and you can also hack uh, machines and robots that are you're fighting against so sometimes it's really good even if you're not breaking into terminals all day to have your hacker friend uh helping you out you know with debuffs or um doing damage to software instead of the hard shell case of something that is too tough to crack mm -hmm. and that includes people with too much cyberware Speaking of that, speaking of that, since you mentioned too much cyberware, um, one of the things that has sparked a lot of a lot of arguments regarding regarding cyberware is things like essence, or in um, cyber in cyberpunk's case, um, I think it was empathy. You know that you know this upper limit on how much cyberware you can have. You can have. Do you do you guys have a system like that, or is it, or is it a case of you can have as much as you can actually spend money on? We definitely had to limit it. Uh, the cyberware is way too good to not put any limits on it. Um, mm -hmm. And it uses the same resource that your magic uses. So you're you're doing a very similar split there on like which one of these two things do I want to be good at? Mm -hmm. um, we one one thing we did add in, which is a little bit uh, underrepresented, I think, in our genre, is we also just added an ability in there that is all natural. So if you decide to not do either one of these two things, you just get more experience for having having, you know, survived this this horrible world without the assistance of either the magic or the technology that's available to you. Mm -hmm. so you kind of progress through the XP chart a little bit faster than everybody else. Yeah. As like, a, there's always somebody who doesn't want to do either one of those two things, and it felt like we should give them some reward for for that. Speaking um, of ma speaking of magic. Shadowrun is pre is famous or infamous, depending on who you ask, for the spell burn mechanic regarding how um, spells are cast. All right, and I'm curious how you guys are going to be regulating sp um, spell use to make sure that people aren't just casting the nuke button every time they get the chance. Nah, nuke things. <laughs> There's a limit to how much magic you can do in a turn, and that, that is your, your essence score. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd subtract any cyberware you put in yourself from your from your essence score to get your magic, so generally you're doing one or the other. Um, but then you get those points back every turn, and you can do it again next turn. Um, we didn't we didn't want to say that being a mage means that you know halfway through the day you run out of energy uh, and can't be a mage anymore. Um, and then this is a little tangential to what you asked, but one of the things I like about our magic system is that pretty much all of our spells are like one sentence, maybe two sentences. So it doesn't have that D&D &D syndrome of like, well, let me read this paragraph for 10 minutes before I can figure out how my spell works. Um, you spend your MP, you do your thing, and then next turn, you can do it again. Mm -hmm. 
and within the within that, when it comes to when it comes to weaponry, um, that was you already made it clear that ma that magic weaponry is likely going to be melee. But with ranged weaponry, do you guys plan on having options so that people can cu can customize it so that say their ri their rifle isn't always going to be a stock rifle? Oh yeah, yeah. I want to say it's a solid. 30 odd different customization options for any given weapon. We love customization, both on melee weapons, ranged weapons, and our armors and shields in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and our drones the, and our vehicles. We want to make sure you have all the ability to flavor and fluff and, and rules and get all the cool little tidbits that you want. Guns, one of our favorite things is being able to swap between ammo types. So, oh my gosh, here comes the big armor tank. Let's swap to the anti armor, the armor piercing rounds. Oh, hey, this dodgy fairy character is ruining our day. Let's switch to flechette rounds and, and you know, bird shot them. Um, or even like, uh, gosh, I just want a laser sight or a foregrip for, for or some cool, you know, you know, all that sweet modification you can do in your call of duty game or something you know you can really trick out your thing to have as much as uh it has a cap value and all the things cost cap and, and adding things um to its capacity mm -hmm. now 3d bullet printer yeah <laughs> um i i was given that given that I was I was a bit I was a bit curious if um if pe if in play if in playtesting people have come up with crazy yet dangerous weapons because look I love I love using the noisy cricket or giving mm -hmm. it out to or giving it out to players just so that just to see what happens. <laughs> uh... Yeah, I think even in my last session I shot a. a, a flaming inferno rocket and there happened to be an ally on the ground but boy do vampires hate fire so i just went for it anyways <laughs> look a bullet may have your name on it but a rocket merely says to whom it may concern <laughs> exactly exactly or i suppose another way to put it is see that guy over there fuck him and everybody else around him yep yep you can do that mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we have demolition kits that let you build a big ass bomb. I believe is literally our terminology for it. Um, you know, figure out how to blow up that big skyscraper or whatever. We've got um, a rocket and missile system. We've got a grenade system where there's probably about ten different kinds of grenades you can throw depending on what you need them for. Um, we also have at the end of our kind of Artillery weapons is what we like to call them. Is a really radical um, uh, railgun. Just opens holes and all the things. Very very delightful. And um, one of the ones we're super proud of is our full auto mechanic mm -hmm. for our artillery and other you know shooty you know your Uzis and your M16s and stuff like that. We just have um, a really simple system where if you're attacking a whole group of people you're going to make two rolls you're going to know the result against all the people you're attacking or you know if you want to direct all those bullets against one target and really knock out that big werewolf or something we can you can hose him and there's all kinds of fun um abilities and bonuses to swiss cheese him or to make it harder to dodge the wall of lead coming at him um we're just really proud of how uh, simplified yet satisfying it is to kind of use those full auto weapons the way that um, uh, you know the gunmaker intended. Mm -hmm. And since you, since you brought since you brought that up, how do you get how would um, how would how would recoil work? Yeah, so there's a baseline recoil penalty for the the types of shots you're taking mm -hmm. um and there's some some different ways some different abilities if you if you want to take gun show and be a real strong guy who's shooting full auto that gives you some recoil compensation um and then there's a bunch of different things you can do to weapons some weapons are better at taking on the recoil compensation some of them are a little bit worse based on 
you know, how big a bullet you're shooting. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, so there's a base minus four penalty if you're just trying to, like, you know, annihilate one guy. Yeah. And you'll, uh, you'll already have on your character sheet figured out how much of that you have compensated and how much that works out. And then if you're trying to shoot a whole bunch of people, it's just one penalty based on the number of people you're shooting. And you'll just have to reference your recoil penalty to figure out what that attack roll penalty might be. Yeah. I, um, I remember playing a troll sniper at one point whose weapon of choice was a, mo- was a, essentially a, mo- essentially a modified sniper version of a fat Mac. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that sounds fun. You know, granted, it, granted, it was only one shot. Bef- it's only one shot before he has to re- before he has to reload the thing. But it's one sh- it's one shot in JDJ. <laughs> I mean, we have a few. We our ammo system is uh, a slightly more interesting system in that the way that you pay for all those interesting ammo mods is based on the ammo of the gun you're putting them on. Mm-hmm. So it's much cheaper if for your two shot elephant rifle to buy all the different custom, uh, ammo upgrades than it is for your Uzi. Mm-hmm. Um, so you you gain that, that low ammo quality is actually, you know, it's still a disadvantage, but there's still a lot of, a lot of cool things that it lets it opens up for you. Yeah. Now, with the, with that in with that in mind, since I'm since you guys have brought, since Shadowrun has been brought has been brought up frequently, I'm curious if you guys are using a dice pool system for your core mechanic, or if you if you've got something else in mind. Two d six. Everybody knows how that math works. Yeah, all of our standard rolls and. Um, checks and accuracies and everything take 2d6 and add up your stat. We also have um, surging a roll, which can add a dice to it, or honing a roll, which adds a dice, and then you remove the lowest dice from the, the, the set you're rolling. Mm-hmm. Really, I think the most dice we've ever thrown at a time is five? Yeah, like you gotta that. do some weird stuff to make that happen, but it's theoretically possible. Based on how you describe it, it sounds like do that a five roll set a five dice setup would be that would be for the munchkiniest of munchkins. Yes, yes. Yeah. You've really pushed things off a cliff on the limit. Uh, if you're if you're throwing five dice around at a time. And really if yeah, even throwing three is gonna net you some pretty serious seriously good results most of the time. And anything you can do to stop the enemies from throwing three dice at a time, you usually uh, go out of your way to get done at early. Yeah. Now, with all that, with all that said, are you? What are you guys shooting for as far as a page count? Uh, two twenty, two forty, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a few caveats with that. Mm-hmm. Each one of our weapons is going to have its own art entry. Uh, all of our all of mm, some of the more like spy equipment stuff might not have its own art entry, but like we're we're really kind of taking our time with the weapons and really kind of giving you the ability to look over like is is this both flavor and rules wise what what I really want my character to be doing at this point in time. Mm-hmm. Um, the other kind of cool caveat. Oh, go ahead, Richard. So no, no, I'll you. The other really cool caveat about our book and system is we're pulling the monster manual out of the book. It is not going to be locked up in a dusty tome that you have to flip through 8,000 times to get the one spell you needed for the one monster. Um, We're breaking everything down into a card deck. All of our monsters will be on tarot-sized cards. Everything you need to know about them is either on the card or paired up on the GM screen so you have that reference right in front of you. And they'll slot in to our really kind of, I don't know, revolutionary is maybe not the right word, but really dynamic um, screen so that the players can see art of what they're fighting. You don't have to, like, hold up the book and show them the monster without giving away the stats. They can see what they're going up against, and you have all the reference you need staring you back in the face for all the kind of bonuses it has, what it's allergic to, and um, what kinds of weapons it might have to, to throw at you. 
so taking that taking that into account, taking that into account, um, I, given how people given how people are shifting into, um, virtual tabletop, whether it be Roll Twenty or the Found or the Foundry or the like, um, do you guys have plans to support that down the road? Yeah, I don't think that'd be hard either. Um, the condensed information should make them having a tab open that has that that information in front of them should be pretty easy and then the art's already been isolated for them mm -hmm. so as far as a, our our first round of demos that we did was actually on roll 20 and yeah. um i suppose that's a not a terrible time to mention that our bosses are actually pretty different um our mm -hmm. bosses are location oriented so you're actually looking at a boss board in the demo you'll fight bob who's a 20 foot tall uh ai powered mech and uh, you'll decide whether or not you want to shoot him in the legs or shoot him in the arms or shoot him in the rocket launcher. Uh, pro tip, shoot him in the rocket launcher. Um, but uh, you're actually kind of working out what it is that you want to focus on when you're fighting a boss also so that they don't end up being just a bucket of 200 hit points. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of extra agency given to the players on that front. But that boss board being in front of people on Roll20 actually worked out really, really well. Yeah. I just posted an example of it in our little chat we're having here just to show you what the GM's looking at when there's all this stuff in front of him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can target one area of this and try to knock out some of the stuff. You know, that way your boss has the action economy they need and all the special abilities they need what, uh, uh, going up against a whole team of players without having to have mooks unless you really want to add some mooks in. Yeah. In that same regard... Um, are you going to be putting cut cu um, custom setups so that if people want to create their want to create their own monsters or create their own bosses, that'll be covered? It's a big priority of ours. We're not exactly sure how it's going to work yet, but it's it's be on the radar right now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now, with that in mind, when are you get when are you guys planning on launching when it comes to Kickstarter? Uh. We're still kind of working out that that number. We're, it's definitely this year. It's somewhere between first and second quarter of this year. Um, we're we're really hoping for first quarter, but we really want to do things right. So if that means second quarter, then that's what we're going to do. All right. No, and I will be certain. I will be most certainly looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with all of that said. I would like to sincerely thank all of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to the show and enjoy the madness. Thank you. This was great. Mm -hmm. And anytime you guys see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Excellent. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>